Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Let's welcome our first speaker, Alicia from San Carlos. My name is Alicia, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Alicia. Thanks. Um, so I have to be honest. When they asked me to do this panel, I mean, I, I obviously fit the qualifications because I am a parent. Uh, but there was a part in the back of my head that felt like I'm the least qualified to speak about this subject. And it, and it set in motion a train of thinking for me um, that really kind of led me to realize that all I have to share with you is my own experience and, and being honest with you. And, um, and the more I thought about it, right, that, that gut inclination that I'm not qualified, um, the more I started reaching out to other parents in sobriety and asking them if they had these same feelings that I live with constantly. Um, for me, as an, I, I have a sobriety date. It's February 25th, 2007. And I, um, I know for myself, one of the strongest motivating factors for me to get loaded was when I felt like I wasn't living in line with my truth. Uh, when I was feeling guilty because I wasn't living at my highest self. One of the things of being a parent, whether you're an alcoholic or not, because the topic is parenting and wi um, is that it comes with a tremendous amount of guilt. And um, I think many, many parents, no matter how what you're doing, no matter how much time you're spending, no matter what you're buying, what your what your activities you're engaging in, you're constantly. I know for myself, I'm constantly feeling like I need to do better, and so that led to me feeling like I wasn't qualified to speak on this panel. And when I talked to other people and realized that a lot of other people felt the exact same way, um, that there's this there's this really big balance that has to be found, um, not only in sobriety but in young people's and in parenting. Um, my daughter, I, I have a daughter. She's 11 years old right now. She'll be 12 next month. Um, if you do the math, that means she was only seven um, when I got sober. That means she saw a lot of my disease. Uh, seven is old enough to do things like cook meals in a microwave for yourself or grab crackers out of the cupboard, and it's also um, old enough to remember some of that behavior. Um, that leaves me with more mother's guilt. Um, and so, you know, I talked to my daughter before, before coming here and I was like, what, what do you have to say about your experience in young people? And, you know, her answer was, well, I get a better version of my mom, but I also get less time with my mom. And it's, and it's one of those, um, it's one of those trade-offs. Like I know that when I'm with her, when I have time with her, I'm there fully present, fully wanting to be there, not waiting for that time to be over so that I can go get loaded. But I also know that for me to be there in a healthy way, um, I also have to maintain my sobriety. And um, that has been uh, a struggle for me, not maintaining my sobriety, but finding that balance. Uh, there are a lot of responsibilities that come with parenting if you're, if you're, if you're doing it effectively. Um, and... Um, you know, there are things that I have to think about, especially when I'm in a room of young people in Alcoholics Anonymous, that uh, that are things that they don't have to think about. Because um, let, let's be honest, the, the majority of people in, in young people AA don't have children. So a majority of them don't understand the to-do list that's constantly going on in the back of my head. Um, and so it's easy for them to say, well, why can't you just come out and, ha and hang out at coffee until 2 a.m.? Well, there's school in the morning. There are things that I have to do. Like, even if I wanted to, 
like I've got, I'm cold. I'm, you know, like, and, and trust me, I've, I've tried to get my child to kick it. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, she's of the age where, where, where she'll speak up. And, um, you know, and that's why, like, I feel like I have gone from one extreme to the other and back and forth. So I guess I do have some experience to share with you in that respect. Um, I served for three years on a committee in Santa Clara County, um, a, d- a different uh, number of positions, one of those positions being uh, the chairperson, which takes a lot of time. You're spending a lot more time with people. And so during that time frame, I mean, I was dragging her everywhere. I was dragging her to events. I was dragging her to the meetings, to the business meetings. There's the, the meeting after the meeting. There's, you know, the people that are calling you because because you're on a committee together and they're freaking out because of their relationship issues or whatever's going on. And so my phone was always ringing. And so there was constantly something to do. And, and you know, and I'm, and I'm dragging her along on that service. And, and like, you know, one, one day she sits, I try to, this is the one thing that I do try to consistently do is communicate with my child to just kind of get my report card. Like, how are you doing? Are you happy? How am I doing? What do you need from me? Am I, you know, and, and just kind of gauge where I'm at in that respect. And, um, it's, it's like a punch in the gut when your child tells you that they feel like you don't, they don't, you don't have time for them. And, um, it became very apparent after that conversation that I needed to change some things. And so I took a huge step back from young people's committees, um, completely removing myself from young people's committees and really trying to focus more on my parenting. And then I found myself in a place where I was again feeling lonely and isolated and, um, and that's not fun either. And so, um, this, this is what led to this conflict and feeling like I, um, I, I have yet to maintain any kind of, uh, knowledge or wisdom to pass on to you other than for me, this is a, this is a, a day by day decision, um, that I have to make on where my time goes. Um, I, I'm, I'm a single mom. Her, her, her father's serving life in prison. One of, one of the things that led to my sobriety, um, was that whole encounter, um, that led him to, to being struck out. And so I'm very grateful for the situation. Um, that man was very abusive. It's probably best that he's completely removed from our life. Um, but, you know, it, there are times where it would be nice to have more input. And so what I'm saying is I'm a single parent in sobriety. And so I also have to work full time. And so, you know, so there's, there's a lot. And and I hope this doesn't come across as like me trying to throw a pity party. What I'm trying, the message that I'm trying to convey to you is that if you're out there and you're struggling with things like um, balancing work with parenting, with your friendships, with your sobriety, with your family, with your relationship. um, Yeah, me too. (laughs) And so, and so, you know, it's like constantly a struggle. You know, they have that circus act where they've got the plates spinning on the little sticks all the time, you know, and I'm like, I feel like I'm constantly going back to like fix which plate's spinning. And I can't tell you that like I keep them spinning all the time. Sometimes I feel like they all go crashing to the floor and then I got to go, you know, start over with new plates and, and new perspective and, and new motivations. And um, so if there's anything that I can pass on to you, you know, uh, before I'm done, um, it's that if you're struggling with that time management and finding that balance, I, I think that that's kind of the norm. Um, I talk to other women um, in young peoples that have children in all different ages, and uh, it seems like we have that that commonality. Like, I, I I can't excel in one of those areas. I've kind of got to spread my time out between all of those areas. And uh, it, I really, what I rely on is my God conscience that I've developed over the years of sobriety um, to kind of to kind of guide me on what needs attention at this point in time, like what what needs the most attention now. Um, I remember the very first meeting I came into, the very very first meeting. Didn't even know what a sponsor was. You know, somebody mentioned a step in in, in a meeting, and I had to look at the wall to see what step they were talking about. And, uh, after my very first meeting, I brought my daughter with me and it was ironically, it was a women's meeting. And, uh, a woman came up to me after that meeting and told me, um, it was very disrespectful of you to bring your daughter to this meeting because there were people that wanted to share and say things that they couldn't have said because your child was in the room. And, um, 
and I was, I totally felt like I disrespected AA and like, I would never be invited back. And like, thank God for the people that really understand what's going on because a woman caught me at the door and was like, screw that woman. Like, that's not what we do around here, you know? And, and I think like, it's very, very, um, when I hear a baby cry in a meeting, the last thing that I do is get annoyed or frustrated or want to shush that baby. I understand parents need to get sober too. I don't think a lot of people understand that. I, I do hear a lot of the, oh, why are they bringing their kid into a meeting? <laughs> why do you think they're bringing their kid into a meeting? Would you rather have a drug addict, alcoholic mom neglecting her baby so she can go slam dope in the corner or go slam a fifth of vodka in the corner? I think, I think that there's a lot of perspective sometimes that, you know, there's, there's, I don't think it's that we don't understand what their thinking is. Cause I know I participated in that before I was, and I'm like, God, shut your kid up, you know, until you're on the other side and you're like, Oh, I can't. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, and, and until I, I really feel like it's a community within a community and, 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 and there's a lot of love and support in that community because we, we kind of understand. And I can give you an example. This Monday, I had to go. I have a commitment at Juvenile Hall. It's a great commitment. I love H&I. I love being of service and giving back. Um, but I can't take my daughter in there with me. And so I, you know, I had to call another alcoholic mom. And, and you know, it's easier to ask another alcoholic mom in those kind of binds, like, hey, can you, um, I can't take her in. Can, can you take her, you know? And I think that we are more motivated to help each other in that area because it is, um, I think it's a very little under, I don't speak up much about this subject in meetings or try to change people's opinion or try to get them to understand. Um, but I think if you're a parent in this room, you understand that something happens and your entire perspective on life changes and you realize that you're not only responsible for yourself anymore, but you're entirely responsible for the life of another human being. And that's scary. That's scary. Her well-being relies on me, and I can't even keep myself well 100% of the time. And um, I think that it is, it affects all of my defects, trying to be the best parent that I can be. Um, because I want to, what I've realized, um, there is that urge. Yeah, I want to go hang out at 11 yeah, I want, I want to go do this and that and, and not worry about the responsibilities. And I want to, you know, take her out of school and go on vacations and this and that. And, um, what I realized is that I can apply a lot of the principles I've been taught for sobriety. Um, I, you know, I can treat her like a principal, you know, and I, they, I've been told over the years that, you know, winners do what they have to losers do what they want to. There's a lot of stuff I want to do, but there's a lot of stuff I have to do. And, and the reason that I have to do that is because I've, I've done it on the other side where I've done what I've wanted to do. And then I was left with a worse feeling because I wasn't being true to myself. And for me, I know today that being a good parent, um, trumps, uh, some things in, in young people's in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, there are a lot of, you know, late night gatherings that I, I no longer participate in, um, because I, I used to, and, uh, because I want to be a better parent because I want to give her more structure and more, more of a routine. Um, one of the tools that I use to, uh, to assist with that, um, so that I don't feel because I, one of the, the other, um, the other side of that as well is also that, that fear of resenting my child for that, that, that I have to, uh, you know, and I, and I think it's such a delicate subject, but, but there is that fear that I will feel hurt that I have to have this responsibility, even though I know how much of a joy it is to me. And, um, that's why I have to make sure that I do take care of myself and that I can't completely neglect that side of things. Uh, what I've found is the phone is a really useful tool for those types of scenarios. I can still maintain communication with uh, young people in Alcoholics Anonymous, the friendships that I made in the beginning, and keep those alive um, while still being at home with my child. And I, I, you know, one of the things that I do in an effort to make sure that I am not neglecting her needs 
Um, and this started in sobriety. Actually, it started before, but it fell off. Um, but every Wednesday is mother-daughter date night, and no phones are allowed, and it, the only point is just that it's her and I together, and we do something. And we've done everything from run around boat docks to go to Sky High, which is a place with a bunch of trampolines, to have a picnic in the park, just whatever, just as long as her and I are together. And I just I talk to her and I listen to her. And um, and that helps me feel better. Like I do it for her. But on the other side, it helps me feel better. Um, I think that I know for myself, I'm extremely hard on myself. So I'm constantly striving to become a better person, to be more uh, me at my best. I'm constantly striving to be me at my best. And um, I feel like I fall short a lot of the time from being the parent that I want to be. And um, I don't know uh, a parent that I can name that hasn't told me they feel the same. Um, so if all you get from me today is just relation, that this is a struggle, yeah, <laughs> and that this is something that um, is really, really hard to not only find balance in, but maintain balance in. Yeah, I don't think that there is one key that fits this lock. I don't think that there's one way to to say, like, well, this is how you do it. Um, I think that everybody's life is different, and I think that when I listen to my gut uh, in trying to determine what needs the most attention at this point in time, if I'm suffering, I'm suffering, and I and I need to be more involved. Um, but at the same time, I um, I want to be involved in my daughter's life. Um, I have had CPS called on me in sobriety because uh, you know my, I I have my there were out they thought my daughter was living at my mom's house and her boyfriend is an alcoholic and so he was fighting in front of my daughter and so see i had to like i was like sober and like resentful that like i was dealing with cps and like it wasn't even like my stuff that brought him and um and um and you know like all of the things that we have to you know the like in in life like there's no fear of like like an authority coming and like taking like my sanity away, you know, like an authority. But like when you're a parent, there is an authority that will come and, and take your baby away if, you, if, if they feel like you are not doing your job. And um, that's a scary thing. That's really scary. I don't know. My intuition is just um, guiding me to speak about this. But, you know, I think that it's it's. There's a lot more accountability is what I'm saying. Um, you know, we, we can, we can slack off on our sobriety and there's, there's, there's pain. That's our consequence, but we slack off on our parenting and like somebody's knocking on our door. And, um, and I, and I just, I feel like, you know, when I, when I asked my daughter, um, you know, how, it, what do you like about, um, meetings uh in young people's and she was like i wish i had a babysitter and you know i and she's like and now i'm old enough where people are starting to think that i'm a member <laughs> and i um it made me laugh you know one thing people can argue that you know the proof is in the pudding i i just think i had a really good rough draft because i i do have such a um such a, a wonderful child um and the only thing that I really try to do is, is listen and gauge from there. And I've had to stop taking her to events because I had to start explaining things that uh, were happening on the dance floor or questions that she had about, you know what I mean? Like, mom, what's a camel toe? You know, and like, <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and so it's, I kind of, I find myself in, in the middle of young people's settings having to like, yell out like 11 year old in the room, you know, like, and, and most people are mostly respectful, mostly. Um, but you know, they forget a lot and it is my responsibility to put her in either environments where she is safe and, and I don't have to be awkward or to communicate with her after. And so I feel like I'm all over the place in, in this area, but that's because that's exactly how I feel in this area. I'm all over the place in this area. And, uh, I don't think that there is any, like, master way to, to, to 
teach someone how to raise kids and stay involved in young paw, in young paw, in my paw. You know, I think, I think it's a situational basis. I think I go from my gut. I think I know that as long as I'm, I'm paying attention to the, the, the staples of my sobriety, the book, the power of the people, um, to maintain my sobriety and I'm paying attention when I need to step that up, um, then I always find my way somehow. Um, and if I have to cut out the fun, then that's what I have to do. Um, because that's, that's the commitment that I took, um, when I, when I had that baby. And I am, um, I'm proud of that commitment. I love being a mom. Like I, I remember like I was a weird eight year old, like walking around, like I want to be artificially inseminated as soon as I can. Like who, <laughs> who says that? Like, I don't need a man. I just want a baby. <laughs> and, and I, you know, and I, and I, and I got my baby and, you know, she's, she's my friend, but she's also my daughter and I, I, I need to be her discipline. Um, but I also need to be her love. And, uh, AA teaches me how to do that. AA teaches me how to be me at my best. And then me at my best knows the, the mother that I want to be. And then I try to strive for that. And I fall short all the time. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. If you're falling short, I think everybody does. I think we're really hard on ourselves. And, um, you know, if, if you're here and you're sober and you're a parent, give yourself a break. That's awesome. So thanks. Let's welcome our second speaker, uh, Gino F. from Sacramento. Hi, my name is Gino. I'm an alcoholic. We love you, Gino. Oh, bunches. I like that. Um, so, um, I'm an alcoholic and my sobriety, I have a sobriety date. It's November 1st, 2010. I have a sponsor. I work the 12 steps and I'm starting to sponsor people as well. And I have a home group. It's a daily attitude adjustment in Sacramento, California. Um, where do I start? Uh, oh, I have a nine year old daughter too. We'll talk more about her later. Um, so I was, um, once one of the, once one of the kids in the rooms of like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and Al Anon and stuff. Um, I remember, I think I was around eight when my mom started going to Al Anon and, I grew up in Fresno, California, and so there wasn't a lot of meetings back then. It was about 21 years ago, um, but I was one of those kids who went to Alateen and all that stuff, and, like, I don't even really remember much of, like, what happened. I think I remember them, like, having me draw the house and, like, the window and all that, like, but that's kind of, like, where I started out at and with my experience with Alcoholics Anonymous and that stuff. Um so, uh, fast forward about 20 years or so. Um, when I was 19, I found out I was gonna, um, I was gonna have my, uh, my daughter and, uh, I was living in San Francisco and partying all the time and, uh, I had to like do a big, do some big changes and I thought my idea of that was just like getting, work, starting work and, getting an apartment and like basically like trying to buckle down and um I did all that like I got I started working and um doing all like being being my idea of responsible but that was also still going out all the time with my friends and partying and uh my daughter was born um January 20th 2001 and or 2002 excuse me and um the night she was born, um, I, I was, um, I think I was hanging out with some friends and, uh, um, I got the call. I think I had a pager back then. I didn't even have a cell phone. I was kind of late on that. I didn't have a car either or a driver's license. So I was out doing something and uh, I got the page. So, uh, so I got to go to the hospital and, uh, um, you know, she's born and I'm like, 
this is fucking crazy. Excuse me. Uh, this is crazy. And um, so we, you know, that that all happens, and I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna go home and like, you know, I'm gonna go meet up with some friends and celebrate at like six in the morning, like. So like right as soon right off the gate, you know, like I was, like I, I mean, I've always been selfish, and that was I, I was thinking about oh, the reason why I'm talking about it because I was thinking about it driving up here yesterday, and I. I was in the car and actually started to cry because, um, it like, I was thinking about what I'm going to talk about here and I'm like, I don't, you know, I'm kind of nervous and I was nervous yesterday and I didn't really know. And I started thinking about, you know, the day she was born and the things I did and, um, it just kind of, it made me be grateful for where I'm at today. Um, and that I don't have to do that anymore. Um, so that was just the beginning, you know, when she was born, you know, I, I, I left you know, immediately to go get loaded and, um, didn't really think it was a big deal. Um, and that continued on, um, for, uh, eight years. Um, I, um, you know, I always had a, a steady job and, um, a place for, um, for my daughter. She always had her own room at my house. Um, I always took care of her. I got her to school but I wasn't really like present for what was going on in her life. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, I remember like simple things like her wanted me to like play, like play house or like, um, drawing and reading books to her. And it would be like, yeah, yeah, like I'll do it. Or if I was reading to her, like I wouldn't be reading to her. I'd be like thinking about myself and like just reading words in the book and like not really paying attention to her and like, that was, that was like where I was at for a long time. And, um, so I don't really have a lot of experience being a, uh, um, a sober parent, I guess, is most of the time I was loaded. But since, um, since I've gotten sober, um, I've noticed that what, what AA has taught me is that, um, I can, now I can be there for her and I can pay attention and I don't do it perfect. Like there's still some times where it's like I get caught up in myself, obviously, and I'm always thinking about me, but I've learned to like stop whatever I'm doing when she's talking and like start listening and, and I can, I can be there for her, not just in like, um, like, you know, providing a place for her to live or, you know, making sure she gets to school. It's now I can, I can open up and listen to her talk and I'm actually listening and I'm not just nodding my head or, you know, acting like, um, I am listening when I'm really just thinking about myself or, you know, how I'm going to go out and party or whatever. And, um, she also goes to meetings with me and she's definitely not feeling it by now. Um, she's like, <laughs> She pretty much goes, we gotta go to, I'm all, let's go, we're gonna go to a meeting. And she's like, oh, do we have to, do I have to go? And like, she, and she's, I mean, she's really polite when she goes, but it's like, she's definitely not into it. And I've like tried to explain to her, like, like lightly, like, well, if, you know, you want, I don't, I don't know how, like, I said it, but I was like, if you want me to keep being the way I am, then, you know, this is what I gotta do. <laughs> She doesn't really get it, I don't think. Like, but I think she notices, like, I, I know, like, um, like, I would always, like, promise her things that I would do with her, and, like, I would always fall short of that, and, like, those are things, like, now I get to do with her. Like, I finally, like, took her to Disneyland, and, like, I've been telling her that since, you know, she was five. And so it's like, and she's been, she doesn't forget, like, she holds me accountable for this shit, you know, and it's like, <laughs> And I finally did it, like, in sobriety, like, imagine that, um, and it's, it's, it's pretty tight, like, and, uh, so those are things that I would never, that I would never do before, you know, like, and I, and when I took her to Disneyland, it was like, I got to be present, you know, like, I was actually, like, having fun and, like, enjoying myself, like, if I would have went when I was loaded, like, it would have just been, like, when are we going to leave, you know? And like, 
not I, I would have probably been like sneaking off somewhere to like try to get a drink or like made her sit and have drinks with me or something so you know and I mean that's the kind of stuff I did before you know like if I was going to take her uh, if I was going to read her uh, a bedtime story is like I'd put my beer down on like the windowsill first and then read her a story but that's not that's not how it is today and it's it feels good you know and it's like like uh I can really relate to what uh Alicia what Alicia was saying um about getting the calls from your friends and like they ask you to do things and they want to go out and they want to hang out and it's like I'm constantly like on like I'm a pretty much a full-time father um I have my daughter during the school year and she goes to her mom's like off and on on the weekends and during the summer so I'm always having to like cancel or not even make plans to do a lot of things in in YPA events or in just normal life events you know it's like and my friend even my friends like like most of them understand but a lot of them are still like giving me shit about it and it's like this is what I signed up for you know and and I enjoy it though it's like I'm glad like I actually like to be home now and like to enjoy my time like being a dad as like before like I would always be able to like figure out plans like to get a babysitter to go party and stuff and now it's like if I don't if I can't make it like I don't really worry about figuring out plans to get a babysitter to go hang out or whatever cuz I I, you know, I enjoy my time with her now and I'm actually there and that's what you guys have taught me. Um, that's what AA has taught me and I'm just, I'm really grateful for it and like, um, and I, I think my daughter does notice it too. I mean, she, she definitely, I mean, like I said, she doesn't really like coming to the meetings, but she, I think she can count on me more now than she could before when, you know, when she asked me to do things or when she, I think she notices that I'm engaging more with her and like doing things because she's, she's bugging me more now to do a lot more stuff. And like, so I mean, I don't know. Um, but, um, I'm kind of blowing it now, huh? <laughs> um, and like, as far as like going, like, I've, I've had to like, since, since it, I know it's like rough going to meetings and bringing her. So like, I've been like getting up really early and going to meetings. Like there's a morning meeting, like probably a mile away from my house. And so like, I'll get up super early and go to that at 6.30 and be back by 7.30 and then get her up and get her ready for school and take her to school. And then it's kind of a good solution for, uh, I found it to be a good solution for my recovery and not oh, to always have to like bring her into it. Um, since, you know, like it's, she doesn't really, she doesn't like going to the meetings. So that's been like what I've been doing or what I try to do during the school year. Summer has been, I've been had the summer free. So I've been like blowing it and sleeping in every day, but my schedule's a bit off right now. Um, but, as far as like parenting and I don't really have a lot of experience, a lot of experience, but the, the short experience that I do have has been good. Um, uh, and I don't really have like a lot of friends that are, um, that are parents in, uh, young people's and alcoholics anonymous. So like sitting here listening to, um, to Alicia speak and, and the fact that there's actually a, a, a meeting and a panel on it is that I'm like, I was sitting here and thinking like, wow, like I really, there's a reason why I'm here. I really need to hear this and like need to hear what everybody has to say. And like, I would never have thought of that. Like normally, I mean, like people are like, Oh, like they're like, Oh, you have a daughter. And like, I'm all, yeah. And like, I met like a few people in AA that have kids and they're mostly, they're mostly older. And like, that's what we relate with is for, you know, beyond being alcoholics is being, you know, having kids and, and alcoholics and on them and being sober and like, doing it and it's like like I don't really share that with a lot of young people there's not a lot of young parents but um I mean I'm, I'm it's kind of tight that there is actually a meeting for this because like I wouldn't like I'm what well, like I said I wouldn't have thought of it to be like you know something 
that there would be a topic on. And um, I'm kind of running out of things to say here. I don't really... Do, how much time do I have left? Okay. Well, I think I'm done because I'm like kind of getting repetitive here. But thanks for showing up. Uh, thank you. Let's welcome our third speaker, Michelle G. from Silver Springs, Maryland. Thank you. What? Sure. Hi, my name is Michelle, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. Oh, uh, my sobriety date is July 4th, 1991, and my home group is the Happy, Joyous, and Free Young People's Group. We meet in Silver Spring, Maryland, and Silver Spring, like, with no S's, like one spring. And uh, we meet on Sunday nights at 7.30, and we have child care. So uh, that's the first thing I want to let you know. But I do want to let you know a little bit about myself um, so you understand how amazing it is that I'm a parent and allowed to, like, take care of anyone, Okay. Because, um, I mean, really. So I got sober in high school, and I come from a alcoholic. Uh, my father's an alcoholic. My family's an alcoholic. And um, I'm half Puerto Rican and I'm half Peruvian. So, like, culturally, we do that. And I understand, like, the Irish are very similar. And uh, so it wasn't like, so it wasn't a big deal. You know, it wasn't a big deal that uh, people drank. You know, um, the kids in my family, and it still goes on, they kind of just, we drink, you know, it's at the table, everyone gets a glass of wine, you take it if you want, you pass it if you don't, not a big deal, and there's really no, you know, there's no age restriction, the law doesn't come into our home, and we just do what we want, so, um, so for me, my alcoholism started, I don't have this huge story about what it was like when I first started drinking, or my first drink, I just always drank. I just always remember um, drinking. It was always a part of my life. And so when I did get sober, I, like I said, I, I got sober in high school when I was really, it was like it was like all these AA circumstances were like caving in on me, you know? And I'm going to just kind of give you a synopsis of my story because I really do want to speak about the topic because it's an important one that I think is overlooked a lot. And what occurred for me is that I, I, was, I was literally like dying, <laughs> You know, I was 30 pounds less than I am now. I was losing my hair and I wasn't eating. And it wasn't because I had an eating disorder because I know a lot of us come in here duly diagnosed and I have the utmost respect for that. I just wasn't eating because I was drinking. Okay. And, um, and that's what happened. And I was already kicked out of my fourth school and I was already, you know, pretty much taking like vacations from my house. And, uh, and I just, and my household was just pretty much involved in alcoholism. So I wasn't, I was pretty much overlooked. And uh, now I can let you know that, and it really it's as a result of the steps, that I can let you know that my parents did the best they could. And I really sincerely mean that. They did the best they could with what they had. And I love them uh, like, like it's nobody's business. Like I just adore them. And, and there's still a lot of alcoholism that goes on in my household. So, all right. So what happened is I, I had this guidance counselor, Mrs. Bowman, and I'll never forget her. She had like blue hair, an English accent. She was awesome. And she never lost contact with me. You know how like you get sober and like, or like you're getting ready to get sober and like you get those phone numbers and you never lose them even when you, you know you threw it away, you know, because you're never going to really call them. It was like that. Like I never lost her number. And she, I called her. You know, I kept in touch with her. She kept in touch with me. She wanted to know I was okay, that I was alive, you know. And and at this point, I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what I was going to do. Like, what what's going on? Like, I'm still in high school. I uh, I have this big hole that's like getting bigger daily, and uh, and I want to die, and I can't figure out how quite to do it. And uh, I'm a little too scared, not really sure. And you know, I, I called her, and I remember letting her know, like, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm going to do. And at that point, I already shared that with my family and uh, the response because there's a lot of, um, you know, my mom was extremely codependent. She's like, 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 really codependent, like card carrying member, like, like she'd take care of you if you came over, and uh, like that's, but that's who she was, you know, seriously. And uh, 
So she, I said, like, Mom, I want to die. Like, I don't know what it is. I want to die. Um, I can't figure it out. And, uh, and she patted me on the knee. She's like, you're going to grow out of this. And, uh, and you'll be just fine. And I, meanwhile, I'm like, I want to put my head through the windshield because we're sitting in the car because she didn't get it. You know, and that was my life. So I felt like my life story at that point was like, you don't get it. So I contacted Mrs. Bowman and what she said was, um, we're going to, um, I'm going to send someone over to talk to you. And what she did, she sent over, she was like 17, this girl. And, uh, and she, okay. It talks about in the book where we're not like people who normally mix. Okay. Well, this is, this is true for this. So this girl who was like, she had really long hair. She had a daisy behind her ear. She had love beads and moccasins comes bouncing up my step. And I literally opened up the door and I couldn't believe it was who you sent me. And, um, so she was like this, like hardcore hippie. And I was like, I was like JLo on the block. Okay. Like that's what I was like, you're kidding me. I mean, I'm confident I had like the earrings down, like, all right. So, so that's who I was. And you sent me the love child and, uh, she, she just, uh, I had no idea. I had no idea that what you were like, what I was getting into. And thank God. Because she, um, she just brought me to meetings and I went to young people's, I went to a young people's meeting and she let me know and she just let me know this is how we do things. You know, she's very hardcore with me. She was not all that hippie stuff went out the window. Um, she broke it down really, and I'm just going to let you know how it was because I only have a little bit of time, but as uh, she let me know, this is, and I need, I was trying to get into a day treatment program and they're very smart. They said, you need to have a sponsor before you get into this program. So I didn't know. So I asked and she said, I'll sponsor you. No problem. And this is what she turned on me. She said, uh, you know, you need to know that like, this is how I do things. And if you want what I have, you're going to do what I do. And what I do is I go to meetings every day and I have a home group. And now your home group's going to be your home group. My home group's going to be your home group. And you're going to get a service vision and uh, you're going to go to these meetings. We're going to get that book and we're going to work those steps. And I was like, what? And really, like, really, this is where I would have said, what an order I can't go through with it. But what I said is okay. That's what I said. And, um, and that was amazing. That was amazing. And my life has been completely different. And that's been, uh, 20 years ago, this Jan, just this July. So, um, I want to, I do, I do want to talk about my daughter, um, because it's a big deal. So it's a topic. Um, so I, I, I actually have two children and I have, and get ready. I have an 18 year old and I have a, a 10 year old and, my, um, by circumstances, um, I ended up taking guardianship of my daughter's father, pay attention, daughter's father, his son. Okay. So I took guardianship of his son because within the first four months of me delivering my daughter, he relapsed. You know, that's what we do sometimes. And, uh, so in literally like no time, I became like a parent of zero to a parent of two. And this particular young man wasn't really interested in me being his, uh, new guardian. And, um, and what happened is first thing I did is I, uh, at that point I was changing sponsors and I found a sponsor who I wanted what she had once again. And she was a mom. She was a mom in AA and she was a new mom. She had had um, kids recently too. And she had gone through a separation and she walked through it with grace and dignity. And that's what I wanted. So I did a lot of what she did and what she did is she brought the kids to meetings and, uh, and I know that there's a lot, like some people really have issues with that. And I'm going to let you know, like go back and let them know where's it say it in the big book. I can't bring my kid really. Okay. And that for me is a big deal. And in the big book, he talks about, we, um, create the fellowship you seek. Well, go do that. Go talk to your home group and say, we need childcare. How can we do it? Because each group is autonomous and you can do whatever you want. And I've been to meetings where they've paid a childcare provider who's licensed to come in. And my home group is a young people's group, so we're broke. So we can't afford that. So we have volunteers who, um, from the group who volunteer 30 minutes of their time. And that's how it works. And sometimes we have eight kids and sometimes we have no kids. 
So that's, you know, be a trailblazer. Do it, you know? And I, I firmly believe that. Because you'll hear, and I think we heard it last night, you'll hear in the rooms that you young people are the future. I agree. But the younger people are the future, you know? And that's the kids. Because I don't know, but if you look at the numbers, um, I'm pretty certain that the number of kids who are alcoholic, who have alcoholic parents, are pretty big. And, um, and I know for me, it was very difficult for me to maneuver. And, you know, I really commend anyone who does it and stay involved in young people's service with two kids. And what I did is I brought them everywhere. Um, currently I'm, I've served like on every YPI position in my like state and I've uh, served also in area service uh, commitments. And I always welcome the people with kids. And it's going to take the people with, um, it really is going to take the people who, who almost, not, I don't want to say well-known in meetings, but at least if you're a home group member, your weight certainly carries something. If you're going to say no, they're welcome. So the person who ever like shuns you or says, you know, no kids, take them out. They're being loud. Sorry. It's just not a, um, that's not okay with me. And I'll be the first one in my, um, in my home to let them know. Like kids are welcome. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention is that, for example, I'm on the Maryland bid for Ikipa this year, and like literally at every meeting we had at least eight kids, you know, and uh, and we called them like they were a subcommittee, you know, <laughs> and they ranged from like age, you know, four months to ten years, and that that's you know that's how much sobriety they had, and <laughs> and they loved it. They loved, they came to pancake breakfasts and they came to meetings at night and they did the disco dances and they loved it. And we had a table set up for them and we had toys and we had a box that we carried around every event. It was part of the events committee, like the events committee had a box of toys. And I mean, that's how we did things. Like, so if you're the only one who's a kid in a meeting and like you need help, there's other people in other states and other areas doing it. So you're not alone. You're not alone. And, um, and I'm fortunate for that because I, you know, I just, my daughter and my son have never had the opportunity to see me, um, see me drink. And, uh, and if it, if it comes down to like, I got to get to a meeting, but I got my kid, I'm going to a meeting and that's it. I brought other people's kids to meetings because I need a meeting, <laughs> you know, like that, like, yeah. I was a nanny at one point in uh, college, and I was like, I brought all the kids. I mean, and, you know, and really to let you know, like, I didn't come in there and, like, give them drum sets to play, you know? I went in there with a plan. Like, my daughter has her little, like, meeting bag that she can only touch those toys while we're in a meeting, and they're, like, cool, so she knows, like, meeting special time because she gets to only touch the meeting bag during meetings. And, like, that's, you got to be creative, you know? Um, and it's hard. And, um, I just, I loved hearing, I loved hearing your stories because that's, that's fantastic to be, to be young and sober and be in AA and continue on. I mean, that's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, um, the last thing, uh, cause I, I do, I am running out of time. Am I running out of time? What time is it then? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so my, I like, I do like to share about my kids because, uh, my my son, he, he's my son. I raised him. I raised him for uh, ten years. His his father got sober, and uh, he now has six years, seven years in in the fellowship. And we don't we raise the children together. We don't we don't live together. We're not together. He's no longer my boo. And uh, and he. You know, but we have a common respect and we've also drawn up some guidelines about what meetings we feel like it's appropriate to bring the kids to and what it's not, you know, and that's something we've been able to work together. And that's only as a result of the steps. Seriously, because there's no way when we first separated that that, w that was like, you know, it was like who got custody of the meetings, you know, and you know what I'm talking about. I mean, that stuff happens. So this year, my, my son, he came to me and he was like, I want to, I want to go live with my dad. And that was like a huge deal because I'd raised, like, I'd raised him. He'd never wanted to go live with his dad. And he wasn't even, like, visiting his dad. And, um, 
So this year, right before his 18th birthday, he said, you know, I wanted to live with my dad. And, and I was like, I just, it was, I, you know, I, I totally wanted to be supportive, but it was like, I wanted to hold on because he's my kid. And I really, I really had to turn to the other parents in the program and talk to them about it. And I really had, I wanted to be the one who walked through this with grace and dignity. And what I came to terms with was that, you know what? He's got his own higher power. These kids have got their own higher power. And I let him go with love. And I just said, you know what? If this is what you want to do, I'm going to totally support it. And I can't tell you, those are really what I was thinking, but that is what came out of my mouth. And, um, and sometimes it's like, I just had to do the footwork. I just had to act as if, and I totally did. But, um, but it worked. He's okay. And he's safe, you know, and, and that's fine. And, um, and my daughter, she's now 10 and she's like, she's skeptical of you all sometimes. You know, she doesn't understand why, like, sometimes she'll see someone staying on our couch and they'll be there for a couple of days and they'll be gone, you know? And like, but you know, she, like, she just, she asks questions. And I answer them appropriately. And I, you know, it's just an open dialogue. I mean, cause really what's an infant supposed to do? Go to Al-Anon? Like, where are they going to go? You know, I mean, they got to come to the meetings. What are you going to do? And in my area, Al- Alateen and Alatot, they're not prevalent and I don't have time to create them yet, you know? And so I'm going to do what I need to do to stay sober. And as long as you remember your primary purpose, as long as I remember my primary purpose, it, it's going to work out. And it is, it is a balance. And so if there's anything I can offer that we can close with that I can let you all know is that, you know what, seriously, as long as you keep your primary purpose in check, there's a solution to this and anything else, you know? So thank you so much for asking me to share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.